So um, it's a big topic, multidisciplinary and health informatics approaches. Um, obviously, can't exhaust the topic in this talk, but I'm coming at this from the angle of my, um, my background. So I do research in population health sciences, so epidemiology and um, sort of real world what's going on in the real human population, um, don't go into animals. Um, I'm also looking after patients with infections on a daily basis. I was on call for general medicine last night, but thankfully it was quiet. So real, actually looking after patients on the ground as well. And the, the clinical lead for the infection intelligence platform is a much smaller part of my role, um, but that's about trying to develop informatics on a national scale. A lot of my research here in Dundee uses routine health data or health informatics. So I'll talk more about that as we go through. So I'm just going to first of all give a bit of context to the, what I'm going to present and some outlined by the UK strategy. Talk about what do I mean by health informatics and what's involved in that kind of um, research. I'm going to talk about Clostridium difficile infection, which people don't obviously think about when you're talking about AMR, but a lot of the issues are very much the same. And actually, antibiotic resistance among C. diff is also important. I'm going to talk about antibiotic use and more, more, what's more commonly understood by AMR um, research using health informatics and developments in informatics that would help us to use this resource much better, um, both things that are happening now and things that we hope will happen in the future. I'm going to talk a little bit at the end about influencing antimicrobial prescribing, so antimicrobial stewards Chip, which has been touched on um, previously. So it's important as we develop new antibiotics and also in using the ones we've already got that we use them properly so to, to reduce the pace of developing antimicrobial resistance. And I'll end with some key messages. So you've all heard already about the O'Neill report, both before today and earlier in the talks. This is a map taken from that report. And this is the distribution of deaths predicted by 2050 if we don't do something about antibiotic resistance. Um, and the size of the circles is the number of deaths in each um, continent, and the mortality per thousand population is determined by the colour. So it's a huge global problem, less of a problem in Europe, but it's a growing problem in Europe, and antibiotics-resistant um, bacteria don't respect boundaries. So with increasing travel, we will have a problem, even though it's more contained at the moment in the UK. So this again, just to say, I'm going to talk about bacteria and gram-negative bacteria, the main focus of the emerging problem currently. These are um, percentage of resistance, again, per continent. Um, and this data is a little bit out of date. This is from 2004. But the, the overall pattern hasn't changed that much. So emerging gram-negative resistance is the big main problem. And ESBL producers, so extended spectrum beta-lactamase producers are the main current problem in the UK. The more highly resistant um, carbapenemase resistant are coming, but are small in number in the UK so far. So again, we've touched on um, the, the five-year antimicrobial resistance strategy for the UK that was published in 2013. And it's got three strategic aims, which I find quite helpful to encompass the breadth of the um, the research that across the translational spectrum. So the first aim is to improve knowledge and understanding of AMR through better information and intelligence. And that's where the health informatics side of things comes in. Secondly, the antimicrobial stewardship and the way you reuse antibiotics in practice is important for the second aim, which is about conserving and stewarding the effectiveness of existing treatments, but I would also say of future treatments. And the third aim, which is not really within my remit, but it's about stimulating development of new technologies, new antibiotics, new diagnostics, and novel therapies. So just to say, AMR, to, to reiterate, AMR is truly um, multidisciplinary across this entire um, translational spectrum, from understanding how a bacteria works physiologically, how a chemical might work as an antibacterial, right to looking at what happens in this patient population if we use this antibiotic. So right across the spectrum, and bioinformatics and medical informatics are important. And the red squares or rectangles around the bits I'm mainly going to talk about today, and the arrow I've added at the top is just to emphasise that this is a bi-directional spectrum. It's not just going from 
bench to bedside. We need to use information the population to inform the basic research. So it goes both ways, back and forth, across the spectrum. So the first aim, um, strategic aim of the strategy is to improve the knowledge and understanding of AMR. So health informatics, what, what does that mean and what's it all about? So apologise if you know all this already, but it's about using data that's produced as part of healthcare and part of everyday life and using that to understand more about um, healthcare and problems and populations. So every being born produces a whole load of data. Every visit to the doctor, to the hospital, there's loads of data produced. And mostly that's plonked in big data warehouses and not used again. But we can actually use, harvest all that data and use it to understand about infections, antibiotic use, and use that data to, to really help tackle AMR, but only if we do it in a safe and secure, secure way that will give um, clinicians and the, the public confidence in the way we're dealing with their data. So we have to protect data, um, patient confidentiality and data security. So I'm going to talk a little bit about C. diff infection. So it had really hit the headlines in 2008-2009. Um, it was all over the news. There were fatal cases in Scottish hospitals, and these were thought to be at least partly preventable. So C. diff is a really sort of nasty bacterial infection. It can cause quite mild diarrhoea, but it can be a life-threatening illness, particularly in um, older adults with multiple comorbidities. So these outbreaks were due to very highly virulent strains, and the main preventable risk factor is antibiotic use. And there were four antibiotics that were picked out as particularly high risk in general use um, at, the, at, at putting people at risk of having C. diff. And conveniently, they all began with C, so then we, we got together this group of high risk 4C antibiotics, and they're listed there. And even though it's not thought of classically under the AMR umbrella, it is important in that a lot of the, is the risks and the patients and the issues of transmission. So when a patient becomes unwell with C. diff, it's normal to carry low levels of C. diff in the bowel. So is it that you're carrying C. diff, you get exposed to an antibiotic that wipes out your other flora and the C. diff propagates and causes disease? Or in some cases, there's proven to be transmission, particularly within the hospital environment between patients. So, th and those kind of issues are the same um, for other antimicrobial resistant bacteria as they are for C. diff. And the sort of public health and economic impact is also um, similar for the two different problems. So, turning into, on to antibiotic use research, so the, in response to those increasing rates of C. diff and the fact that these four C antibiotics were the highest risk antibiotics, we there was a lot of interventions carried out at a national and a local level here in Tayside to try and change antibiotic use. And these all took place sort of around the, in to early 2009. So this is some data from a PhD student of mine who, um, to demonstrate that once we intervened and said using 4Cs is bad for causing C. diff, people are dying of C. diff, this is what happened to antibiotic use in Tayside. So this is GP's prescriptions of antibiotics. So the dashed line at the top is all antibiotic use, and you can see, so this is quarterly data, so within each year you get a fluctuating pattern because antibiotics are used more in the winter than in the summer. And the solid line below is these 4C, these high-risk antibiotics. And you can see that after the intervention, use of the 4C antibiotics <coughs> drops dramatically, but use of total antibiotic use doesn't change at all. And using some statistical modelling, you can work out the percentage reduction in antibiotic use that is due to that intervention. And you can see the estimates of the effect size are down the left-hand side at three time points following the intervention. So it's large and it's sustained and it's highly statistically significant. So this is now looking at four Cs only, so we don't have all antibiotic prescribing on this graph. And this is among different risk groups. So the two top lines are the over 65s and people who live in care homes. So those are the highest risk group for getting C. diff. And they're the highest users of antibiotics at baseline. But after the intervention, there was even bigger reductions among these, these high risk groups, although the rate of 4C prescribing went down in all the risks. So the total antibiotic prescribing stayed the same. 
that four C's went down. So obviously other antibiotics were brought in to, to make up the difference. And these tended to be narrower spectrum and associated with less C. diff, but also with less, should be associated with less antibiotic resistance. So this, because we're using routine data, we also have data on all these patients about what infections they've had and what the resistance patterns were. So we're now going to look at what happened to antibiotic resistance before and after this change in antibiotic use, both in terms of the antibiotics that went down, so that reduces the selection pressure to, for resistance against them, and also against the antibiotics in which use went up to see if there's increased resistance against those antibiotics. So that's the next piece of work, what was the impact on AMR. This also raises some other questions. Um, what are the limitations of using routine healthcare data for this kind of research, and how could we improve this, the, the utility of these data? And this really requires a multidisciplinary approach. And finally, I'm just going to end up on it's what exactly was the intervention. How did we make this huge, dramatic change in antibiotic use? Because that will be um, essential for con controlling the way we use antibiotics in the future. So first of all, limitations of routine data on a global scale. Some countries just don't have the infrastructure and the systems to provide this kind of data. So a lot of the national data about antibiotic resistance is not, it's not complete population data by any means. So this map from the WHO report in 2013, the paler the country, the less data they were able to provide. And this is any national data about antibiotic resistance. So a lot of countries would know very little about the actual rates of resistance. Within a UK context, using sort of standard or health informatics research to date, there's some notable strengths and limitations. So strengths are the scope and size of the data sets. So you can look at people in hospital, in their own home, what's happening to people over a long period of time. And because it's just all data that's just gathered in the population, the researcher doesn't have a lot of biases on gathering the data. Obviously, you can have in analysing it, but that's a slightly different issue. It's low cost, it's pragmatic, and it reflects real life. And you can evaluate changes in practice and policy that you could never actually do in a randomised trial kind of setting. So things that are happening anyway, what has the impact of that been on, on these outcomes such as AMR? And it's observational, so you're not interfering with the patient's care, so there are fewer but not no ethical considerations. A significant number of limitations as well, though. There are regional differences in the way data are collected, even when places have what should be complete data. And there's sampling bias. So not everyone, not all GPs, not all hospital practitioners would submit the same samples from a patient, even with the exact same clinical presentation. There are issues around information governance and data security, because there's this unconsented data. So the patient has to know that the data are being held securely and analysed responsibly. There's no detail about the pathogen. So I've said about, so if, if someone gets C. diff infection or antimicrobial resistant infection, has that patient developed that from their own flora or is that as a result of having transmission from someone else? And the routine um, bacterial data doesn't tell you that. It just tells you these two patients both have E. coli. Maybe they both have resistant E. coli, but is that transmitted from each other or is it just emerged separately? Also, the data at the moment is very retrospective. There's lots of data processing, quality control, cleaning and checking, which is laborious and takes several months um, to make the data actually ready and available for use. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about how we might address those issues and those limitations of routine data. So there's a number of national developments just now about how to use health informatics data better. The Fire Institute on the previous slide is about health informatics more generally. Specific to infection, we have a programme. Um, it's funded by the Scottish Government Healthcare Associated Infection Task Force. But we're not only interested in healthcare associated infection, we're also interested in infections in the community. And this is about standardising and linking together data, the relevant data sets across the whole of Scotland to be able to answer questions about AMR and other hospital associated infections. So, in using those data sets, we were able to look in more detail about a national um, surveillance of Clostridium difficile infection. So these data show the number of cases of C. diff 
um, over the time period there, 2006 to 2013. And previously, all health protectors in Scotland knew where, how many cases you were getting. But in linking those data to the hospital admission and discharge data on those patients who had C. diff, we can determine how many were, were contracted within the healthcare setting and how many were contracted in the community. And that's going to be very important for once you're putting in interventions to try and contain C. diff, and infection control protocol in the hospital isn't going to change um, infections coming in from the community. And you can see both, both types of infection have gone down a lot over the time period, but and community associated infection is, is forming a much bigger proportion of the total number of cases. And there's more and more evidence that a lot of this, this transmissions, reservoirs in the community outside of the hospital that are coming into the hospital rather than it being a purely hospital associated problem. And this is going to feature in future national surveillance reports. Again, no information there about the, which C. diff was related to which other C. diff in that cohort. So we need more information about the pathogens to really understand um, transmission and spread of these conditions. And that's something that's been termed translational bioinformatics by some. OK, I lied. More C. diff. Sorry. So this is a, a study, again, the methodology can be applied to other antimicrobial resistance problems. This is just the, the things that we're further down the line with because of the, the we were, where we are with AMR now in the UK about five, six years ago with C. diff. So these projects are coming to fruition now and we're learning the methods that we can then apply to um, antimicrobial resistance more broadly. So this is a study on the molecular epidemiology of C. diff in Scotland, and this is linking health informatics data with whole genome sequencing. And this is just supposed to show the way that we can link these data and process them in a secure way. So we've identified cases from the Scottish Microbiology Reference Lab. They've sent the bacteria to the, the scientists at the University of Glasgow, anonymised, with just with a study number. They've sent the patient details, and the key thing is a in Scotland, every healthcare episode has a patient's community health index or CHI number attached to it. So you can link across a whole range of data sets by using that unique identifier. So they sent the CHI number to the national health data repositories to extract data on deaths, hospital admissions, um, <coughs> antibiotic prescribing and other prescribing as well from these national data sets. They were all sent to the NHS network in the Health Informatics Centre in Tayside, where they're all linked and anonymised and then made available to researchers in an anonymised fashion in the HIC safe haven. So this is a classic sort of health informatics model with the addition of this microbiological um, genome data. So the purpose of this study is to look at the evolution and spread of C. diff strains in Scotland and look at genotypic and phenotypic resistance and how these link with previous antibiotic use and policy. So antibiotic use at the population level, but also at the patient level <laughs> of the patients who had C. diff, and also to look at genetic markers of adverse clinical outcomes. Again, a very big team involved in this study, um, microbiologists, clinicians, epidemiologists, pharmacists, um, bioinformaticians, biostatisticians, so an, a big team involved in this piece of work. We're well underway. Um, we've got some, some results. This is just a, a high-level, um, not published yet result. But we know that mutations in a certain gene are associated with fluoroquinolone resistance. And we still have to look at this in a wider um, set, data set. But it looks like we found a novel point mutation that's associated with high-level resistance. And that's in addition to the mutations that are associated with low-level resistance. And so we need to investigate the associations between these genetic phenotype, gen genotypes of the causative organisms and the phenotype of the patient who was infected with that bug. And that's the only thing. We can only do that because of these data linkages. I should just mention briefly, there are a number of national initiatives to try and improve the way we look at these sort of data and combine um, bioinformatics and health informatics data. This is a recently launched um, virtual institute involving lots of universities and NHS organisations. I don't know if you can read it, but under major research themes, informatics and molecular epidemiology are both there. So it's early days, but we'll see where, where we can get to with this, with this 
Virtual Institute. And I mentioned earlier that we've got all these data and we can process them and we can use them for research, but actually to be really useful to clinicians at the front line and change the way we use antibiotics and there's much more rapid processing and availability of these kind of data. So to achieve aim two of the strategy, conserve and steward effectiveness of existing and future treatments, we need to exert antimicrobial stewardship, which is a theme that underpins our clinical practice of infection, so using antibiotics in the best way to manage infection, so we get optimal outcomes for that patient, so best clinical outcome, least harm, and least harm to the wider society at the same time. Okay, so we've got better data systems. We can much earlier identify emergence of transmission of AMR between all the different environments, within a household, between households, between patients in hospital, between hospitals, geographical regions, and even the spread of these highly resistant gram-negatives around the world. We need to have much better use of the data, that a lot of which is already produced. For example, when I see a patient in front of me, a patient comes in really septic, unwell, su suspected intra-abdominal sepsis, I don't know when they come in the door. Have they got Klebsiella? Have they got E. coli? Is it Enterococcus, Pseudomonas? What actually is a problematic organism? So we always focus on developing drugs against E. coli, against Pseudomonas, but when they, a patient comes in the door, you don't know what bug they've got. Currently, diagnostics, you would take a, a sample from that patient, probably a blood culture. If they had a really sick, they might go to theatre, you take the pus, and you get your answer within a day or two. So it, you don't have a quick answer as to which bacteria are actually causing that patient's infection. So usually your empirical prescribing is without any information about the infection that patient has right then. If you could harness the data, and what's missing here is the middle box, the data processing. If you could harness all the data that are already there about your local population epidemiology and how it's changing, the patient demographic and health data, the patient's own microbiological and health and antibiotic history, and somehow use some great software, and this is where we need computing, so this is another part of the interdisciplinary spectrum that we need here. They could pull all that data and tell the clinician, using probability, what is the most likely antibiotic you should prescribe that's going to be best for that patient. And again, it might be that it's no antibiotic. They might have flu, they might be more likely to have flu, given everything that's going on around. Um, so that, that would be really important in conserving antibiotics. But this is still based on probability. This isn't a diagnosis. So we still need more rapid diagnostics. It don't take one or two days to get back your result and your full antibiogram. And, we, and regardless of what we do, antibiotic resistance will come. So we do need the new antibiotics that are going to be on the list of options for treating these patients. So going back a wee step, so how can we influence antibiotic prescribing with the systems we've got at the moment? And you're not supposed to be able to read this, so don't worry. So this is about what was the intervention that led to these huge changes in antibiotic prescribing in 2009. So the bottom line is loads of things happened. I mean, we were, when we were writing the paper and we were analysing the data, we were going, this is great. And I thought, we're going to have to define in the paper what the intervention was, what happened that led to all these changes. And it was really difficult. Even those of us who were involved in implementing the changes, it was hard to really pinpoint what exactly did we do that led to these changes in antibiotic use. So this is what we distilled it down to, a table for the paper. But in, in summary, there were the Scottish Government heat targets on reducing C. diff and reducing prescribing of antibiotics associated with C. diff. At health board level, we had education, um, new guidelines, and backed up by the rationale behind them. GPs were given comparative prescribing feedback, your prescribing rates compared to other GPs in your region, but the others were anonymised, but you knew where you stood against others, against their peers. GPs were encouraged to target set, and these sorts of things, activities were incorporated into their professional appraisal, which they have to do anyway, so there was something in it for them as well. And they're also given information to give to patients to um, explain the sort of difference in antibiotic prescribing compared to previous. But which of these things are the, the thing that works and what's the key ingredients to changing practice? 
So we're carrying out two systematic reviews, looking at the literature on interventions to improve antibiotic prescribing, the top one for hospital inpatients and the bottom one in primary care. So these are huge pieces of work. There's a huge amount of literature, but they're not actually, these papers are not very good at describing the, the, what the intervention actually was. So it's challenging. And I'm not going to talk a lot about social science. This is not my area of expertise at all. Um, but in the hospital um, review, we've got uh, Susan Meakey, who's a health psychologist from London. She's a co-applicant um, and co-author of the, the review. And so her team are charged with defining what the behaviour change interventions were. So how, how did the things that were done change the way that people are prescribed? So this, again, just influences how important it is to have the whole of the multidisciplinary spectrum involved in antimicrobial research. I'm not going to say any more about, about behaviour change theory because I can't. OK, so just to finish up, key messages really are we all understand and know AMR is an inevitable public health threat. And we must use the antibiotics we've got carefully to um, ensure their use as far into the future as possible. Health informatics data can be hugely um, helpful. It's a really good resource, but it could be improved even further with use of technology and more interdisciplinary working. And we do need genuine multidisciplinary action to reduce the disastrous consequences of AMR. So that's me finishing, but I'll just mention what we're doing in Dundee. We're trying to get started with better interdisciplinary working, and this website, Morag's here, she prepared the website. So we're getting started with working better in an inter interdisciplinary way. We had our first meeting on Wednesday, and I thought it was really useful, um, and really need to think about how we can really work together. And I think these funding calls really help distill those thoughts and make it into reality that we, we do need to do interdisciplinary working across the university. And it sort of bit, puts a bit of momentum in as well to things that we've all thought were a nice idea, but it's hard to really crystallise. That's my very last slide. This is also from the website for the Centre for Antimicrobial Research. Um, and it also mentions Academic Health Sciences Partnership in the bottom corner. That's yet another new initiative, but that's to um, improve working between the NHS and academia in Tayside. So that's all I have to say. Thank you.